Hello, good evening. Welcome. I'm Karen Tucker, CEO of Churchill Club, and our program is called Revolutions in the Making, Economically Disruptive Technologies. We have a, a broad ranging and I believe very insightful discussion in store for us tonight with our speakers from left to right. Michael Chewy, fellow McKinsey Global Institute and principal McKinsey and Company. Bill Reichert, managing director of Garage Technology Ventures. Barry Schuler, co-founder and managing director DFJ Growth and former chairman and CEO of AOL. And then on the end, we have Hal Varian, Chief Economist at Google. Thank you all so much for being with us tonight. We really appreciate it. This is a roundtable format, which means that everyone on stage is a speaker, per se. Uh, that said, Michael Chewy will also help to guide the conversation. I'd like to extend a big thank you to Citrix Systems for opening their doors to us this evening in their wonderful state-of-the-art conference center here in Santa Clara, California. Thank you also to McKinsey Global Institute, especially you, Michael, and also Rebecca Raboy, for invaluable assistance in developing this program. McKinsey has offered, has furnished for you this evening copies of their new report about economically disruptive technologies. If you haven't picked up your copy, you can do so out in the ante room. If you prefer digital copies, you can go to mckinsey.com slash MGI, and it's available there for you as well. I believe you'll find it to be extremely valuable. A brief Churchill Club introduction for our new guests in the audience. Churchill Club, since 1985, has been convening Silicon Valley-style conversations that uh, are in the interest of supporting innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. We uh, think about this every day in terms of the programs that we create, and tonight is certainly no different. Uh, we present up to 40 programs every year and do this so that like minds can connect with one another and with ideas. We are a 501c3 member-supported organization, and if you are interested in potentially joining us, please do check it out. Our last event of the month is a breakfast next week on June 26th, exploring what makes standout company performers different. It's based on extensive new research by Deloitte, and Michael Rayner, co-author with Clayton Christensen of The Innovator's Solution, a best-selling book, as well as other bestsellers, he is one of the speakers, and this is another great opportunity to connect with others that can matter to you and to gain new insights. We have other events in the pipeline for you, of, of course, including the Future of Manufacturing in July, EMC President David Goulden, August 8th, NetApp CEO Tom Georgens in August, and the Changing the Game Conference and the Churchill Awards on September 26th. If you are tweeting, please use the hashtag Churchill Club and you will find other Twitter codes in your printed programs. And now let us welcome Michael Chewy and the speakers tonight will be introducing themselves. Please welcome Michael. <coughs> Why don't we just do a quick round of introductions. Um, so uh, thank you, Karen. Thanks to the Churchill Club. Uh, thanks for uh, <coughs> Citrix for uh, this venue as well as uh, the folks who have supported this uh, this. Uh, um, uh, this event. Uh, so uh, my name is Michael Chu. I'm a principal at the McKinsey Global Institute, which is McKinsey and Company's research arm. I lead some of our firm's research <coughs> impacts of long-term technology trends, including disruptive technologies. <coughs> and my name is Bill Reichert. I'm managing director with Garage Technology Ventures. We're a seed stage and early stage venture capital fund here in Silicon Valley. We invest across the technology spectrum, excluding life science, but we've um, <coughs> invested in material science and energy tech and clean tech as well as communications, IT, robotics, and other things. Um, I spent most of my career as an entrepreneur, mainly in software, before crossing over and becoming an investor. Same thing for me. Just <laughs> we're, whatever he said, same thing for me. So yes, I have spent most of my life um, probably for, how long have you been a VC? 15 years. All right. <coughs> well, he's, you I'm know, sorry. got... He's got double the career in, in, in investing that, than I do. But I have also spent most of my life as an entrepreneur. Um, I would say serial entrepreneur, but I once gave a speech and someone came up to me afterwards and said, 
So what cereal did you say you invented? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I actually thought that the guy was kidding. He wasn't. Um, anyway. The first um, of many puns tonight. <laughs> Captain Crunch, right? Captain, Captain Crunch. Crunch, yes. <laughs> so uh, dating back to the early days of computing software company that was uh, in the Macintosh space called Cricket Software. If you're old and you're an engineer, you knew Cricket Graph. Um, and uh, then came to Silicon Valley, started a company um, that did a lot of the early technologies of the internet, how you did transactions over the wire, how you even interacted with stuff. And we uh, uh, designed um, America Online and ultimately was acquired by them. And I was there for the growth of America Online from um, a few hundred people. And, and it was a fresh IPO for about $300 million market cap. And six years later was $200 billion company and we acquired Time Warner. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I was CEO. One of the fun, um, disruptive rocket ships rides. And in 2003, I retired and became a VC. And so I uh, started DFJ Growth together with the team at DFJ. And we do a little later stage. So um, not late, late, but when you've got your product and you know the dogs are eating the dog food, as we like to say, and we think you can be really big and substantive, um, then we love to help. I'm Hal Varian. I'm the uh, chief economist at Google. We're a search engine. <laughs> I remember when you were. Uh, yeah. And we do a few other things, too. Right. But uh, let's see, in a previous life, I was a professor and then dean at uh, Berkeley and uh, started a school of information there. And if you can stay out of trouble as a dean for seven years, you get time off for good behavior. So during my, it's, it's harder than you think, actually. <clears throat> but during my, uh, my uh, sabbatical year, I uh, bumped into Eric Schmidt. He said, I just joined this cute little company called Google. This was back in 2002. Why don't you come down and uh, give us a hand, some stuff. And so I went there in uh, 2002. I had so much fun, I stayed on and uh, joined the company full time, I guess, in 2007. Great. Well, thank you. So as you can tell, we have a, a, a tremendously interesting panel here, and we have a tremendously interesting uh, topic, which is uh, disruptive technologies. Um, you might uh, describe this as being a, a little bit of intellectual parkour, but uh, we'll see what we can do about getting through some of these topics. Um, I'll just, uh, you know, just uh, take a couple of, of, of minutes to talk about some of the research that we did. Uh, again, it's uh, over a 170-page uh, report, so I, I won't exhaustively go through ev every uh, piece, but just maybe just call out a few highlights just to get the conversation started. Um, actually, we have a member of our crack research team here, so it, it actually was a, a group effort, uh, uh, for sure. Uh, but when we looked at econ uh, economically disruptive technologies, you know, the question is, what, what are the criteria that we used? Uh, so there, it, was, it was four parts, basically. You know, number one is we were looking for technologies that were either uh, accelerating in terms of their advancement or already on, a, on a, you know, an exponential curve, right? So either the first or second derivative uh, was something significant. Um, secondly, we were looking for technologies that had broad applicability, so across multiple sectors, affecting billions of people, or you know, potentially affecting hundreds of millions of, of workers. We were also looking for technologies that were economically disruptive, that had a lot of potential value at stake. Um, you'll see some of the charts in the report, for instance, are denominated in trillions of dollars per year. That's kind of a big number. So we're looking for big, big numbers. And then finally, we're looking for technologies that actually were transformative in their impact, right? So not only a big number, but they might change industry structures or vastly shift profit pools or change the way that people work fundamentally from day to day. So those are the four sort of categories that we use to find these disruptive technologies. There are, you know, we, we identified a uh, delightful or disruptive dozen that we don't necessarily think that those are the only technologies which are interesting <coughs> or disruptive, but we do think that all of those have the potential, and, uh, and we said over the next dozen years, to really be truly disruptive based on those criteria. I'll just briefly mention the, the categories in which they, f you know, we, we could describe them as falling. One category is, is around you know, rethinking energy, right? So things like renewables, things like advanced oil and gas exploration and, and, and production, things like um, energy storage, for instance. And we'll talk more about you know, some of those uh, as we go through. Another uh, broad category are those technologies which are enabled by IT or are IT related. So cloud and mobile, for instance, <coughs> uh, internet of things automation of knowledge work. So uh, the category of things around IT, and I'll come back to that in a moment, but what's interesting is that IT is so general purpose that it in fact underpins a lot of the other technologies that we identified. 
A third category is ways in, or technologies that affect the ways in which we interact with the physical world, so machines doing work for us. So whether or not it's advanced robotics or uh, autonomous vehicles, self-driving cars and drones and those sorts of things, um, you know, as, as well as 3D printing, which uh, you know, there are folks on the panel who ha have a real passion for that. And then finally, we, we also looked at some technologies that, that really changed the fundamental building blocks of technology in a certain way, right? It's almost a meta thing. Uh, you know, we looked at next generation genomics, for instance. So how does the biological world change things? And, uh, and also, um, you know, other advanced materials. So if it's nanotechnology, you know, all kinds of interesting things around materials. So, you know, lots of implications about that. We'll try to explore that with the panel today. A few things that we discovered as we were looking at these things and, and, and thinking about them. First of all, um, you know, these technologies, while we, uh, while we study them, um, you know, separately, uh, generally when you combine them, you actually, c you know, create more effects, right? So if you think about 3D printing put together with advanced robotics, that can uh, vastly change the way you think about manufacturing, for instance. Um, another uh, comment, just as I look at it, right? If you look at all of the technologies we identified, you know, some of them I just described as being f primarily IT related but all of them actually have some IT in them, right? So if you look at advanced genomics, for instance, all those gene sequencing t machines, which are actually accelerating faster than Moore's Law, they do have some Moore's Law in them as well, right? So there's real IT underneath them. Another thing that's interesting is, you know, who is going to get the benefits is, is going to be one of the big things that will happen. Well, one of the things that we've discovered around most of these technologies is, like, you know, previous waves of technology disruption, a lot of times, a lot of the, the benefits will actually accrue to consumers and citizens and individuals, right? I mean, companies are going to be made. There are a lot of profits that are going to be made, but a lot of times, you know, that, that it's actually all of us who are going to benefit in a sort of a personal way. Um, and then, you know, quite frankly, the way we work is going to change drastically because of a lot of these technologies. And finally, it's going to be a tremendous challenge for policymakers and governments <laughs> to deal with these things. It'll be absolutely essential to figure out what their regulatory and other governmental frameworks are, but, you know, if you think about the potential <coughs> implications of these technologies, both, both positive and, you know, negative, uh, it'll be quite, quite challenging. So, just a, qu a, a few quick observations based on the research that we've done, and of course, there's a lot more to, to, to be found in the report, and you can discuss this with, you know, Shalab or, or others as well, happy to do that. But um, with that being said, why don't we start the conversation? So, Hal, why don't we start with you? When we talked about disruptive technologies before, <coughs> you said, you know, it's really fun to look a dozen years into the future, <coughs> but um, how well would you have done if you'd, you know, done this exercise a dozen years ago, right? So, in 2001. So, you know, it, th that's a question you posed. What, what, what do you think we would have done, or you would have done, or someone would have done if in 2001 we said, you know, what do we think the disruptive technologies in 2013 would be? Yes, this is, uh, this is how I get in trouble for asking these questions. So, uh, <laughs> but, but let me, I, I did have a chance to think about it. I made a list because I didn't want to uh, forget them all, but... Uh, I mean, you searched for the answer. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, barely, I barely touched the computer. Sponsored results. I wanted mm. to... Uh, uh, first of all, I think you should think about the technology we're, that we're expected to be disruptive but weren't. And uh, there, number one on my list is micropayments. Now, you can remember back then, everybody thought the Internet was going to bring this new age of micropayments, would end up paying for things mm -hmm. uh, via the uh, 10 cents, 5 cents, a few cents. It really hasn't happened. Now, we do have a micropayment system, but it's actually called Google because there is the advertiser that are paying 5 cents a click or 10 cents a click or something like that didn't work out anywhere near the way we, we expected. And then the other micro that, uh, that didn't work out that way is Microsoft. Because I think back in 2000, it was widely anticipated Microsoft would take over the world. That hasn't happened either, at least so far. Uh, nanotech, you mentioned, and I think nanotech uh, was anticipated to give more benefits sooner. It's still a technology that's a research technology. We've seen some payoffs, but uh, I think it's, it's promised it's down the road a little bit. And same thing with designer drugs. I think they've been harder than people anticipated, partly for regulatory issues, partly for just science. When you say designer drugs, what do you mean by that? I mean, I mean drugs. The right contacts, that's all. That Sorry. will be high, highly customized drugs at an medicine. individual, at personalized individual medicine. level. Ah, sort of okay. Personalized, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> what, were, what was actually disruptive, well, obviously, <laughs> I mean, everybody agree the internet was disruptive. I mean, it was around in 2000, of course, because that was the, uh, the internet bubble, but it was still mostly dial-up at that time. Broadband met 128 kilobit ISDN. Uh, businesses, universities had broadband, but basically residential was, was almost non-existent. 
uh, search engines. They were also around, but I think people did not understand what an important uh, aspect that would be because if the internet has this huge growth of content, you still have to have the card catalog for the Borges Library, right? Uh, online advertising that, that replaced the, uh, the uh, business model that was assumed of, of micropayments. Uh, personalization, open source is kind of an interesting thing. If you think about LAMP, you know, LAMP built the internet, really. <coughs> and, it, and of course, open source has been around for a long time, but I don't think people thought about how mainstream it would become over that decade. What's, what's LAMP? I love LAMP. Yeah, li Linux, Apache, MySQL, and Python or Perl, depending on your okay. religion. Uh, <clears throat> but that would be the kind of thing that uh, people just in its infancy in terms of mass uh, adoption. Mobile devices, huge thing, broadband, YouTube, Netflix, video conferencing, all this stuff was built uh, on top of uh, broadband. And then, you know, what's the buzzword of the last couple of years? Big data. We had to develop the technologies for dealing with the massive amounts of data that went along with the internet. So NoSQL databases and big tables and MapReduce and all that stuff came up during the, uh, the last decade. So I would say all of those things, uh, uh, if we looked back to 2000, we would guess at some of them that didn't happen. We would guess correctly on some that happened, and then we'd just completely miss a few of them. Yeah. Hmm. Very it's interesting. So one thing that Hal brings up is you know, the, the time it takes for some of these disruptive technologies to actually take hold. I, I know you've done some thinking about it. How, how do you think about figuring out the timing of these things? Well, it never happens as fast as entrepreneurs or investors want them to, um, and that's that's for sure. Um, you know, I think I think uh, what what we end up seeing with truly transformative technologies, particularly when it comes to consumer adoption, if you go back and you look historically, it takes about a decade um, for something to be introduced, for early adopters to start using it. Um, then, if it's good enough to be used by um, people, you'll hit a cost curve of getting it to be, you know, um, at the right price points for the mass market to adopt. Um, and then, you know, a lot of manufacturers start manufacturing and something really gets, um, and you've seen that with formats of media, if you go back from, you know, records going to tape and tape going to CDs and, um, and then um, ultimately to, to digital streaming, actually that one you know took a bit longer um, from the time that you could because of um, resistance inside of the industry. Copyright holders really not wanting to embrace new formats and being um, scared because of the privacy issues. But um, you know, and we can innovate much much faster and invent things much much faster than markets necessarily. Um, can absorb them, even if they're going to. And of course, there are many failures along the way, innovations that people go, meh. <laughs> is, is the pace yeah. of change accelerating? Is it get happening faster, or do you think it's a decade for everything? <laughs> well, I would say that uh, the pace of innovation is changing. Mm. Um, uh, I think that uh, I, I couldn't tell you definitively um, if the, the pace that the market is adopting things is chasing, is, is, is changing, um, you know, because you have big incumbent businesses that resist change. Mm -hmm. Cable companies resisting change, Microsoft resisting, you know, uh, their franchise moving to the cloud, things like that. That <coughs> becomes part of the calculus. Bill, you have a pensive look about this. Well, yeah, be, I mean, this is, so here's a factoid. Here's a factoid related to this issue of pace of change that I, I find hugely cognitively dissonant in terms of, of, you know, trying to reconcile the data with our personal experience, which is that it feels like the pace of change is accelerating, right? That's what it feels like. But, you know, look at the data, at least in one cut of the data. What was the most successful technology of the 20th century if you use as the measure of set success the speed, the, the speed at which it was adopted in the United States, we'll take the United States because it's you know, a developed country. What was the most successful technology in terms of pace of adoption in the 20th century? The previous century. Anybody know? Connect. What? Connect. Connect. Well, that wasn't actually 
<laughs> that wasn't actually in the 20th century. But we'll, we'll keep... <laughs> Sorry, thank you for playing. <laughs> Anybody, come on, 20th century, remember? That was the time, for those of you who, it's 1900 to 2000, okay? That was... <laughs> <laughs> Television, there's one thought, okay. Radio. Radio. Yeah. It was the radio. I, I'll, we, can, you know, we can stop there. <laughs> Believe it or not, it was the radio. The radio was, t was adopted by 60% of households in America within the first six years of release. You know, look at cell phones, look at computers, look at anything, and they were not adopted that quickly, right? And any technology we think was rapidly <coughs> adopted was not adopted that quickly. T TVs were the second most rapidly adopted um, technology of the 20th century. You know, but the radio was introduced in the early 20s. And, you know, and it was the ultimate plug-and-play technology that transformed the world, right? So this is back to, you know, this discussion about pace of innovation versus pace of change. Um, you know, and to, to the larger point, you know, we're in the middle here of Silicon Valley. We ha have almost no ability to have perspective, I think, at some level, right? Because, you know, one of my favorite quotes about this is, um, you know, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. So, you know, the reason every entrepreneur in Silicon Valley misses their business plan is because they can see the future, right? They see the beginnings of these transformative technologies. And we all get all excited because we think, aha, transformative technology, you know. Thin film solar, transformative technology, right? It will change the planet. It will change the planet, and we therefore assume that it should go faster. We sh it should go faster than it is. But unfortunately, you know, if you're outside of Silicon Valley, you know, you see, it looks like cell phones. And if you're obviously, if you're in the developing world, where we've had 500 million people become reasonably, at some level, you know, crawl out of poverty, po crawl out of poverty in the last 15, 20 years. That's hugely transformative. We don't, you know, but that's because of technologies that were invented 100 years ago, right? Yeah, one thing I would take issue with having six portfolio companies in New York, they're good at missing their plans, too. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a bug or a Sorry. feature that we yeah, have these, right. <laughs> these, like, technology blinders on where we think things are, are going to happen faster? I mean, I think, I, I certainly agree. I think yeah. Barry's right that what you can do in the lab is very different from what you know happens in, in human in human organizations, right? You've got these various human organizations like regulatory bodies and consumer preferences. Look, you know, pe people in Hollywood go see movies no one wants to see here, and that's because they're into a, the art of making film. Um, we lust after technology. For us, the you know, journey is the reward. We you know we love in general, playing with the stuff. That's not how consumers behave. Um, they just want the it. They don't care about the getting there and how it was made and if it's Java or Hadoop or whatever the hell got it in front of their face. They just want it. Um, and they don't want to go through the experience and pain of getting it. When it's ready and it makes their life better, then they'll buy. And you know that's not consistent with you know, technology-oriented or um, creators and entrepreneurs because we love making it as well. And uh, that's, you know, part of the challenge of investing in it is being able to um, see the clear path and if there is one. Let's take a specific family of technologies, right, which, uh -huh. you know, to a certain extent there is this, you know, interesting technologies involved, questions about investment and says, so let, let's, let's talk about energy technologies, whether it's renewables or clean tech or you know, advanced oil and gas. So, Love it. Love Bill, it. I know you spent some time <laughs> investing there. You know, what's exciting there and, and, and you know, what's that? Well, yeah, I mean, the challenge is everything's exciting there. I mean, the, uh, and, you know, the reason that's a challenge is because the market doesn't necessarily appreciate all the things that are exciting there because of this this, um, this bad period we went through of getting overly excited and over-investing in, in, in a whole bunch of technologies that were going to just take a lot longer than, again, we hoped. But, uh, you know, to pick, to pick one, solar is really exciting. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's, you won't find... Why, why is that? 
Why is solar? Because it's changing the world. You know, uh, you know, end to end, solar is changing the world because now what we're seeing is the original promise of solar at the front end uh, in terms of being able to develop materials and manufacture them at a cost that converts sunlight into energy is, you know, it, we're starting to cross this, this line that says, wow, we really can, without government subsidies in a lot of places on the planet, make solar cells that make sense. So it's, you know, again, I'm not necessarily advocating, well, maybe I would advocate going out and buying solar socks. Go ahead. <laughs> um, they may still be low. But, um, and then the, all the way to the other end of solar, you know, through deployment and financing and, you know, it's, it's absolutely, it's changing the world. And we'll look at, you know, this blip we had here the same way, um, you know, we look at the blip of the railroads when the railroads were built. You know, back in the 19th century, everybody over-invested in railroads and everybody went bankrupt investing in railroads, right? That was one of the, you know, famous historical technological bubbles, right? Same with radio. Everybody invested in radios. And, you know, a whole bunch of people went bankrupt investing in radios because, you know, it was the wave of the future. So um, it's, uh, I think we'll see, you know, solar has, has wonderful legs going forward and it's, you know, implementation across the board. And just, again, I, I, I can keep going across energy technologies and I think there's just a lot of, of positive stuff there, um, which doesn't necessarily mean buy today. But in terms and now of I have cognitive frame. dissonance. Yeah. You say go buy, and then mm -hmm. like you gave a lot of examples of companies w that went out of business in the past. Well, the hope is that we've gone through our going out of business phase ah. <laughs> on the solar side. You know, maybe not entirely yet, but there's still some that are hanging around. Um, but I think long term, you know, in the time frame we're talking about here, you know, we will see that as being, you know, one of the, ob you know, we'll look back and say, of course, it was obvious you know, solar was going to be widely deployed. Or you also spend some time in clean tech. What, what, yes. makes, what makes something investable? I mean, what, what actually is? Yeah. Well, that would, you know, be different for everybody. Um, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, I think it's important to keep in mind that our style of innovation in our capitalist society um, necessitates a lot of martyrdom. Um, and, you know, that... It just so happens that, you know, everyone says, what's the next big idea? Well, the, yeah. you know, the next big idea is always composed of a lot of people who have died along the way to getting there. You know, rarely is there the one who just gets it right perfectly. Um, you know, there's a lot of carnage along the way. Um, and that's sort of what makes it precious. And it's that collective learning that, that makes it work. Um, you know, solar, I agree. I think solar is incredibly exciting. Um, I have a 180 kilowatt um, solar farm on my property in Napa, um, and uh, huh. and you know, it, however, at the same time, um, you know, I'm cranking out a megawatt during the day, in the you're summer. You're consuming it. No, I'm oh, you're, you're sending it back on the grid. Yeah. It's not powering my house directly, um, because a we can't store it yet. Um, you know, b. Uh, it, if I sent it directly to my house, I'm SOL at night when it's dark, um, unless I have some battery system, which we haven't figured out how to do yet. So there's a lot of work because, you know, solar is on the edge, and we need our, our grid to behave like the Internet, meaning you can move power around uh, based on demand the same way we move packets of information around. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and that's being worked on. I think that smart grid and the technologies that it, it um, will take to do it, um, uh, it is a really important area. Um, we love solar. We decided we hated solar components. He may be the only guy who made any money on <laughs> solar components. We thought it looked like um, memory in the 80s, and since most of the people here don't even look like they were born in the 80s. Um, uh, <coughs> You know, but there a was a made money in there, right? <laughs> well, a couple, they did. Right, a couple. Come, come, <laughs> couple made money, but you know, there was tremendous uh -huh. demand, and then it all went uh -huh. to Asian overcapacity and bang. Mm -hmm. um, so we assumed solar panels were going to crash in price, and who would win? Um, and we invested in a company called Solar City, and they install panels. Um, they become your energy company, and that you know worked. Um, we like solar thermal. I mean, look, you know, if you look at some of the things that are important but are longer term, um, biofuels, um, the potential to 
um, you know, harness uh, the inherent properties of algae to produce the lipids that we use fossilized in oil. Very promising area, will take a long time to sort out. And you have this bogey of, you know, the oil companies who can manipulate price um, and sort of wait you out as an investor. So um, I love clean tech. I think it's um, really important to us as a country. As an investor, though, I'm very cautious. So how will it happen if it's important for society but <coughs> investors are cautious? Hal? Well, I was going to say, I, I think if we look over the next uh, 10 years, the big story is going to be natural gas. I mean, it's not exactly clean, but it's a third of the carbon emissions of coal. It's become very, very cheap. There looks like there's a lot of it, and it's going to permeate the economy. And it's already the case that on the East Coast, they're putting uh, natural gas uh, replenishment stores along the eastern seaboard so you can move long-haul trucking onto natural gas. And I think that will happen throughout the entire country that's going to lower delivery costs, it's lowering shipping costs, it's going to have a big impact across the economy. Now this is something that I think is occurring pretty quickly, but mm -hmm. fracking has been around for 30 years. It's not a new technology, it's just what you were saying. There are a lot of people that lost money in it, there was a lot of effort and a lot of uh, dreams were broken, but it's a successful technology and assuming they can deal with the environmental issues, which I believe can be addressed easily, <coughs> uh, relatively easily, uh, it's going to have a big impact in the next 10 years. But the transformation, the transformation there was market, not technology. Yes. It was $100 oil. You know, so that, you know. Well, that's the pricing issue. That's, that, that is, we, have, we are so um, you know, embedded with the infrastructure and, and the amount of pure liquid we move around to power things. Mm -hmm. Um, that, uh, you know, the ability to control supply and demand um, is also the ability to, to throttle um, innovation in the space because... So you really think the oil guys are the bad guys? No, I didn't say they were the bad guys okay. all right. at all. Um, okay. what, I was, I, what I said yeah, was okay. <laughs> everybody was investing when people looked at $100 you know, dollar oil saying it's only going up. Mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and then when you're investing in a technology, remember... Just six years ago, um, solar, uh, solar panels were six, seven bucks a watt. They're under a buck now. I mean, and a lot of that had to do with stimulus, you know, the stimulus program mm -hmm. and, in, and investment in the space. Um, and, the, and now it's at grid parity. That's why it's, mm -hmm. so, ex it's so exciting. Um, if you want to use liquid fuels out, outside of natural gas, which is good for certain things, um, uh, if you really wanted to replace fuel, um, you are going to have to always deal with this bogey of your target changing <laughs> um, uh, because there is enough supply in the world um, and you can spend more money to get it. And by managing that commodity, you know, you can really push investment in a, in a fuel um, out of the range of the private sector's ability to keep supporting it. That may be a little esoteric point mm -hmm. here, but you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, so what do you think of yeah. new nuclear or next generation nuclear? Anybody care? Is that, is that's not on the list, is it? It it's doesn't not. matter if it's okay. on the list. <laughs> it's a panel discussion. <laughs> is it? I mean, I, I, are either of you guys yeah, thinking I, next generation nuclear has a future? I, and I, I think within the 12 year period it doesn't, but I think. I mean. I think it would have, I think it was on a roll till Fukushima came along. Yeah. And there was some, there's some very interesting, you know, the micro plants. Right. And the Indians are doing thorium. Yeah. That's kind of interesting. I mean, we'll see where that goes. Yeah. But I'm sorry. No, back no. to you, Michael. That's all right. Well, I, I think it, I think come back, comes back to what you were saying a minute ago. Right now, there are cheaper energy sources yeah. where you don't have the regulatory and the popular resistance. And I think uh, the opinion will flow towards the easiest uh, route, <coughs> which is LNG and solar. Well, Those externalities matter, right? Yeah. Let me, let me try shifting gears a little bit. I mean, one of the other observations was IT underpins a lot of these technologies, including, as you said, smart grid, for instance, mm -hmm. et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. um, so let's explore some of those. <coughs> or maybe, how I could start with you. I mean, one of the things that we talked about was automation of knowledge work, right? We yes. used to say the things that people do well, things that machines do well. I think increasingly we're finding the machines can do things that we thought that only people could do well. So, you know, 
your company does a lot of interesting things uh, <laughs> amongst others, as well as the other observations you have. Could you talk a little more about what, what that might mean? Well, let me put in a plug for the National Science Foundation and for ARPA, because a lot of the uh, infrastructure, the intellectual infrastructure for these innovations came out of those organizations. Mm -hmm. There were actually three search engines, Lycos, Inc. to Me, and Google came out of the NSF Digital Library Project because they correctly saw that this was an important issue, they provided funding to universities, and you've had huge commercial returns. Mm. Driverless car, same story, that came out of ARPA because obviously drones or driverless vehicles have huge military applications, but even huger civilian applications. And so Google, I think it was Larry Page who saw a demonstration of the Stanford uh, group that was working on autonomous vehicles, thought we had some things to add to that and basically hired the group uh, over to Google. And what do we have to add? Well, the big component was Street View because we had Street View, we had Google Maps, and you could add in that IT infrastructure that turned this laboratory technology into something that's on the roads today. Uh, so the IT made a huge contribution there, and I have to say, the people who worked in those programs said, wow, that was a breakthrough because that moved it out of the laboratory into uh, commercialization. I think we're going to see more and more of this. Uh, but I don't think it'll necessarily be abrupt because if you think mm -hmm. about it, your car has been getting more driverless with every new car, right? Uh, nowadays, you have, first of all, there was collision avoidance, and then there's uh, the rear view cameras, and then there's the par auto parking cars, and so on and so on. So these features will begin creeping into cars, and uh, I think we'll see driverless cars on the road within a few, few years. What's a few? A few? Uh, well, we see them on the road right now on an experimental basis, but commercially available vehicles, I believe, within five years. And uh, in fact, you know, my, my favorite plan, I'll, I'll throw this out to the audience, instead of build, building this uh, high-speed train from L.A. to California, we just add another lane onto Interstate 5 and say autonomous vehicles only. You already because have it. You have the HOV lane. Just put a rail on it and people will be happy. Uh, that, that, <laughs> that would, that would be train. fine. But, but if you yeah. can have oh. only the driverless cars on the road without yeah. those crazy human people, that is a much, much easier problem. Yeah. Mm. They're the problem, not the robots. Have you been mm. in the car? Oh, yes. And what's it like? Oh, it's, it's, it's great. I mean, I, I've been in it in, on 101 where we were cruising up and down the freeway. The freeway is an ideal environment because it's so dull and boring. And that's bad for humans and good for robots. Uh, we did have a little bit of a problem. I was also in it in Washington, D.C., and there's an issue there because the driverless car obeys the law. Hmm. And if you're trying to drive through a bunch of pedestrians in Washington, D.C., and you obey the law, the guy behind you starts honking his horn. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the challenge is how can you get the car to navigate <coughs> through, this, uh, through this crazy environment in a way that's uh, legal, safe, and, uh, and effective? Have they tried Boston yet? I mean, Boston, I, Boston, <laughs> is, that's the moonshot. Forget about it. <laughs> Forget about it. <laughs> Other than being cool and interesting, why, why, why are driverless cars valuable? I mean, what, what? Oh, it's a, it's a trillion dollar uh, economic opportunity. Think about your car. It's sitting for 22 <coughs> hours out of the day, most likely. Right? What a huge waste of capital. You have made this huge capital investment. It's sitting most of the time. It should be out earning a living. <laughs> Right? I mean, we, you know, you... It, Spoken it, like a parent. It, <laughs> it makes much more sense to have a traffic information, infra I mean, a traffic uh, infrastructure that's much more like a taxi system with uh, <coughs> ubiquitous vehicles that can do point-to-point -point delivery. It's really, uh, I, I, I think, the right uh, that model. Doesn't, that doesn't require driverless. That requires the, the business model solved, uh, right? Well, that's, that's right, but it requires a, lo a low Lift enough cost. And, right. Side you know, car just, and just even things like, you know, what's the trouble with San Francisco, for example, mm -hmm. it's not the driving. Driving's not bad. It's the parking that's bad. Mm -hmm. So why are the cars parking in the first place? They just <coughs> drive off somewhere and then come back when you call. Kind of like the Batmobile. So, uh, so it's 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 those kinds of it's innovations like where you make a <laughs> five years given amount of capital yeah. much 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 more effective. Great, Barry. Speaking oh. of uh, interesting uh, physical technologies, you've described yourself as a 3D printing junkie. Uh, what yeah. what does that mean and why? Um, the junkie part. <laughs> <laughs> Up to you. Answer the question however you like. Huh. Uh, well, you know, so this. Um, <clears throat> 
technology has been around for quite a while. Um, it's pretty analogous to. We'll talk um, about it just a little bit. Just yeah, a when, yeah, of what it is. Yeah. Is there anyone here not know not 3D? We're on YouTube. <laughs> what? Yeah. We're on YouTube. Um, or you're okay. So you know, it's been around for 30 years. Um, it's called additive technology. It's very simple. It it will take something you design on a computer, um, slice it into layers, and then a machine will build it up from, from the ground up. So there's an example here um, of a chess piece. You can pass that around if you want. My iPhone case has been 3D printed. Siri was not 3D printed. Um, and uh, so designed using 3D modeling software. Then another piece of software cuts this into little layers. And then a machine will build this up somehow. In this case, it was done by melting plastic filament um, and building it up one layer at a time, sort of like a squirting out a hot gun and a, you know, X, Y, Z path that's going to build it, move up, build the next one, and make this. Um, this was used a uh, similar way. It's built a layer at a time, but it's done with um, photosensitive uh, plastic liquid resin, and then a laser writes the path, and when it writes it, it hardens it and builds it up, and it makes a nice... Um, shut up. Stop <laughs> wow, did a good job of translating all the stuff I was saying. Uh. Anyway, go away, girl. Um, <laughs> the NSA now knows and what you said. <laughs> yes. Uh, I always, always expected it. So, um, you know, why, why is this... Shut up. I should have brought my galaxy. Um, yes. <laughs> I agree. Anyway, so why, why is it why interesting? Because, like, Think about computers in the 60s and 70s, you know, great technology, very little access to it by mere mortals, and all of a sudden microcomputers come along. Um, lots of people get to use it, and then lots of people invent and innovate. Um, so now all of a sudden this technology comes along and you can make things. Um, and so, so who wants to do that? Right now, it, it's, a, it's gotten very frothy space. There's an enormous amount of innovation. When we talk about the um, speed of innovation. I think this particular space in the last three years, I've seen the innovation breathtaking. Why? Because there's a worldwide collaboration going on. An open standard for a design called RepRap came out. Um, the electronics that, that um, make these machines work largely have been um, uh, Arduino, another open standard, which means everybody's collaborating and making these better and better um, as the software. So all of a sudden, it's not just a couple of people in a garage. It's a lot of people in a lot of you know, um, garages late at night adding to the collective knowledge. And we've seen um, these go from very hacky, the first one three years ago to build. It was awful to build, by the way. Um, and, uh, and now, um, you know, there are young companies out with 3D printers. There's been an explosion of innovation in the materials. And there's a few points of view about, so what does this mean? A lot of people think, well, everybody's going to have a 3D printer in their home and they're going to just make things. Um, I'm not that crazy about that idea. Um, for a variety of reasons in the near term, it's pretty geeky and hard to do. Um, I might argue that in the next decade, um, Amazon or some company like it is selling files, you know, iPhone cases, and you do have a box in the corner that you shove a, some cartridges into, and there's a class of things you can buy that instead of having to be shipped to you up here, Star Trek style, um, uh, in your 3D printer, that's a scenario that what that, kinds of things that might work out. Printed? Well, I mean, you know, just in, in the, literally in the last year, the only thing you could print on low-cost printers w was pretty rigid plastic, um, Lego-style plastic called ABS and a more environmentally friendly one um, called PLA. Just in the last year, a uh, soft material that's rubbery um, has come out that you could make shoes, flip-flops certainly, um, wood, um, Polymer that uh, that has a lot of wood in it, sandstone, nylon. Um, you know, they they are printing things that behave like fabric. Um, it, it, even for a geek like me, I can barely keep up um, and test these things that are that are coming along. So I think you will see 
a whole class of stuff. Now you go talk to the guys at MIT, they're, they want to print this. They, they don't want to just print the case, but you know, they're, they are <laughs> the at the molecular level, just right. want to print whole circuits um, and you know, are doing a lot of that stuff. So project this out um, a period of time. Um, now, you know, the industrial 3D printers are used and are being increasingly used. Um, uh, DOD, uh, certain parts of drones are 3D printed for security reasons, keeps it out of their supply chain. Um, it lets them iterate in the field. If you have 3D printers wherever the, um, you know, your aircraft are and you want to upgrade a part, you can just make it and replace it there. Um, you know, they want to fill them on aircraft carriers. And, and then when you start to project it out, what, what I think is a more interesting um, notion around this does combine your theme of IT, big data, personalization, and the idea that you know, for all of our lives, we have been um, the product of, of mass production. So you go back to the farm era, and when things were handmade, things were scarce. It took a long time to get a suit. It had to be handmade. Um, then the industrial era comes along, and we have plenty. Everything you want is there, except that my jeans are a little tight right now. I don't know if that's me or the damn jeans, but <laughs> we're always trying to adjust to the things we buy. That's how we shop, because you have to choose what sizes you're going to make, what colors and styles you're going to make. All of a sudden, if you have machines that can take your data, you know that body scanner you walk through in the airport? <laughs> That's you. Um, you can take that geometry and now make clothes for you, or shoes for you. And by the way, there are biological printers that could make your ear with your DNA and um, replacement parts. So you start to see um, you know, the beginnings when you combine the idea of we have lots of data, IT, in digital form. I have a company that is um, doing vaccines, working on the ability um, to rapidly create vaccines and then transmit them to the equivalent of a 3D printer for vaccines all over the world so that if there's an, an outbreak, um, instead of having to incubate build, ship it out, it's in every hospital, there's your personalized medicine at some point, because you have the IT part, everything's digital, and now you have the crossover to making them physical, and I think it's pretty profound. So that's why I'm a junkie. Yeah. So, so actually, go, going back to the 2000s, where we started mm -hmm. the lead-off question, what was the buzzword then? Mass customization. Right. Didn't quite work out that time, but I think you're right. Starting to. I, I, no, I think you're right. That it, you know, it, it takes several tries. Remember I'd how many tries there were on e-books, where we had e-book, yep. e finally it clicked. You, Same thing you with guys are doing a great cycle. job. Yeah. So if you go by, if, you're, if you are a Google person and you use all their apps, everything, you have your Google identity, you buy a Nexus phone, put your name in. Guess what? The phone magically transforms itself to you. All your stuff is there. Everything down to your last search. It's bonding. Yeah, that's that's. <laughs> I mean that that we are. So I that's agree, what you we, call it. Bonding. Okay. You know, that's the leading edge of real personalization, or what I would call hyper personalization. And I think we're going to see that cross the physical boundaries. Um, there's actually no reason why, when that phone came, it wasn't also customized to what you wanted because when you ordered it, instead of it flying off of a line with, you know, um, you know Apple does it a little bit with a laser etched um, right. engraving, but a heck of a lot more about these devices and things we buy can start to be very personalized and customized. But and certainly at a minimum. <coughs> At a minimum, we could have earbuds that actually fit. Right? Yeah, that, we, that would be. Yeah. There you go. I mean, <laughs> we should do that. <laughs> Want to start a company? Yeah. It? Right. Opportunity it found. Seems kind of seems kind of obvious, but yeah. Well, no, I mean, it's the question. The big question is, I mean, it's so this is a classic case of of a you know clearly this is inevitable, right? I mean, this is as inevitable as computing was with you know with the development of mass customization. But well, in, in additive manufacturing, okay. you know, broadly defined, the question is what path will it go down in what, in what time frame? And in terms of the macroeconomic impact, you know, the reason, one of the reasons people like to talk about additive manufacturing is because they like to believe that it will transform, you know, the American economy back to the ability to manufacture here as opposed to having to manufacture everything in China. Um, I guess this is more of a HAL question. <laughs> 
<laughs> Man, but um, I don't know if uh, if if the, in anything close to the time spans that we're caring about here, that it will be able to have that effect. I think. Yeah, I've thought about this a lot, and I, I think there's a, um, a piece of this when we look at uh, manufacturing leaving our economy and, um, and mass scale. Um, you know, there is a potential. Uh, look, I have a, a few pieces of equipment, a couple of 3D printers, a laser cutter, um, a little CNC mill. For 20000 bucks. I have a fabrication. I can make anything um, that's designed on the computer. Yeah, but but here, right. just hear me out for a second. <laughs> If you have people designing, and we, you know, the internet creates some fundamental efficiencies with marketplace. Look at Etsy, mm -hmm. right? Anyone use Etsy? Buy handcrafted stuff mm -hmm. um, online. Those people right. are in business, and you know, we could move to where all of these technologies enable people to be artisanal or go back to the days of small businesses that are servicing their community with customizable. Person, uh, personalizable products of some kinds, not everything, but of some kinds, um, and that might be transformative, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. It feels like it's still at the tchotchke level as opposed to the Walmart level, right? I mean... It, it is of, totally yeah. at the tchotchke <laughs> level until something in your house breaks well. that you realize you can make like a knob on your cappuccino mm -hmm. machine mm -hmm. um, or a connector to your light or whatever. Or better yet, if you're a geek and you can design it, you can do it. But it's the same thing, this collective informa information. People are designing things and replacement parts and breakneck speed uploading them and sharing them on the right. internet. And so you have so-and-so cappuccino machine and you're looking for a knob, you can go search for it and lo and behold, now you're just downloading a file and your printer's making it and you didn't have to go through the pain of, you know, building the geometry to fit on your yeah. machine. So. Well, but the, the other sort of, you know, sort of <coughs> economic factor is the other thing that's happened in this past period of time is our logistics have gotten so good that you can make things almost anywhere and get them almost anywhere else yep. overnight. <coughs> and so, you know, instead of having to learn how to do a 3D printer, I just say, I want that knob. Yeah, I agree. I, I think, I think yeah. what we'll see in the near term out of this that will have impact um, is uh, between Arduino, um, mm -hmm. which allows you to prototype electronic circuits very inexpensively and easily in 3D printers, um, I think we're going to see a renaissance of hardware, new widgets, new kinds of hardware, connected hardware. This goes back to your mm -hmm. Internet of Things. I think it will be less, it will be cheaper to um, invent new things and with crowdfunding even test market them um, without a huge amount of capital because you know Silicon Valley VCs have not been all that crazy about investing in hardware mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and, and this enables I think a very rich prototyping and inventioneering environment um, and Fast cycles, cheaper to figure out if something can fly in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So, Bill, you said that this, mm -hmm. maybe it feels like tchotchke is not like Walmart. What what does feel like Walmart to you? I'm sorry, in terms of the, the macro The sense. potential, the potential <laughs> for new businesses. Yeah, well, you know, there's something, um, uh, you know, this is, this, is, this, is a, this is a tough one. I mean, that the phenomenon that is overwhelming but has not quite yet manifest itself in technology as far as I can see, and we'll crowdsource here. Maybe you guys have the answer, right? Which is, it's, it's astonishing to me how connected we are. You know, I mean, and, you know, and, and we thought we were really connected 10 years ago because we had the internet, and you know, we finally got some Russians on the internet, but... Um, and the majority of the world is still not connected. But the, the majority of the world is still not connected, and the degree to which we can see down to the high definition level almost anywhere on the planet is expanding at such a rapid pace in terms of our ability to connect and see and, and <coughs> communicate and solve problems together. I, you know, just the, I, I'm not sure how that's going to play out. It's, it's way bigger than social, right? The fact that, that we can help each other globally at, at, at a level where, that we couldn't I mean, we almost were there 10 years ago, but what we saw 
you know, one of the big transformations of our economy over the last 50 years was globalization. And that caused, you know, that caused a massive disruption. And Walmart was the, you know, primary beneficiary of that, arguably. You know, because Walmart captured globalization and the logistics and the manufacturing of the planet and reconfigured our economy in such a way that they could disrupt pretty much every retailer in America got disrupted at some level by Walmart. Um, so what's the next layer up for the information economy in terms of, of knowledge work and problem solving now that we have an unbelievable degree of connectivity with people up and down the stack arguably you've got a couple of billion people who are on the internet right there are a couple of billion people who are on the internet who still have you know vast problems that need to be solved how can we how can we how can we help them in a way that's economic so it's not a a a um, a negative sum game, well, not, uh, it's, it's not a zero sum game for us where shipping manufacturing to China loses jobs here, but rather solving problems elsewhere in the world, you know, increases <coughs> the quality of life for everyone. So what are those problems? What are the problems? Well, you know, big problems in health, in water, in jobs, in education, you know, the most, you know, the biggest one, which I don't think is on your list, right? The biggest one that's, that everybody is enthusiastic about now is education and that's the most digital of these problems for us to solve that arguably arguably we should be better at solving you know we've got an educational problem down the road not just around the planet and that's you know so there can an, <laughs> entrepreneur, an issue there can, can an entrepreneur do something about that you know it, one of my companies was dedicated to doing something about that uh, I, I co-founded a company called academic systems in the early 90s which thought oh my god now we have networks and so you can now distribute educational, interactive educational material um, over networks. And you can get peer-to-peer -peer tutoring, and you can think of all the things you can do now that you can connect. You know, that was 20 years ago. That was 20 years ago we started that. You know, we <coughs> built it up, we sold it. You know, it was, great, it was a great outcome. But it's been unbelievably disappointing to me how slow we have progressed in terms of educational technology over the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the yeah. way, TV uh -huh. was supposed to be a revolution in education too. Yes, well, you know, printing was supposed to be a revolution. Yeah. <laughs> well, and arguably they were. They right? were. Yeah. Arguably they were. But, you know, it's back to the why do things move so slowly? Yeah. And what's the answer? And the answer is it's this pesky humans that get in the way. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> Speaking of pesky humans, right? Yes. So interesting opportunities for entrepreneurs. Hal, it's a hilarious but uh, I'll, I'll have you be the big company representative <laughs> there's something about <laughs> disruption like which disrupts big companies True. so you know if you're at a big company and you're a leader what what do you do about this though well I think uh, one of the things you have to do is you have to uh, be on your toes you have to diversify what you're doing you have to cut losers quickly uh, there's a lot of issues where <coughs> Uh, one of the most important things that you want to do in, in, in a time like the one we live in today is uh, be open to experimentation and try different things. So we try a lot of things that we don't necessarily expect will really work, but if they work, they have a big payoff. So you have to have that frame of mind just like any uh, VC investor has. Uh, we know not everything's going to pay off. The returns to uh, venture capital are very highly skewed, but uh, if you want to play the game, you've got to put your uh, chips on the table. How do you get an employee to go out there and do that? Well, because I, I think y you make sure that they understand that there's no uh, penalty for, for failure, mm -hmm. that uh, they are expected to try this thing. We hope it will work. We'll provide resources for it, but you have to anticipate that not everything pays off. So one of the problems is, is you want to make sure that there isn't a big penalty to, to failure. I mean, you know, bankruptcy laws are a great driver of innovation because people will go out and try things. If you had a, a more draconian bankruptcy law, you'd have a lot less innovation going on. Mm. It's one of the things, by the way, did, turn to the political realm for yeah. a minute. Yeah. Uh, this is one of the things that, uh, that it always irked me about the Solyndra story 
if you are investing in clean tech and you don't have some failures, you're not investing in enough risky alternatives. <laughs> uh, you know, what, what does it mean to have a government program or a subsidization program where everything succeeds? That's not experimentation. Let the market do that. Mm -hmm. There's a colleague of mine <laughs> who says um, what Silicon Valley calls innovation, Washington, D.C. calls fraud, abuse, and waste. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Barry, it's, you, you have had well, an interest. But by the way, you've got to remember, your fraud, abuse, and waste is somebody else's job. <coughs> a bureaucrat. Interesting way to think about that. <laughs> a That's right. Right then. Barry, you've, you've had an interesting background, right? You've, you've spent time you know, looking at small companies. You've you know, been CEO of a, a, a fast-growing and large enterprise. You know, how do those creatures relate? Um, well, you know, uh, generally in our lifetime, most big companies, certainly there are ones that preceded us, like Thomas Edison's and, um, uh, you know, the, in tech, the big companies started out as little companies and grew at breathtaking velocity, and then they ultimately face disruption. Um, Google has actually done a masterful job, um, uniquely masterful job, because Typically, um, what happens to big companies is their strength becomes their weakness. Um, you know, they get to a critical mass in something that is so important and, and, and are, of course, a slave to their investors, Wall Street, um, that they, it's not that they don't see a disruption coming. Um, they can't necessarily take the pain or do the things they need to do or are unwilling to um, to deal with it. Um, now, Microsoft, which has been a whatever, however you want to um, think about them, hugely successful company, dr uh, you know, drove the first era of getting computers out and ubiquitous, um, and has had a virtual monopoly, if not, you know, uh, now is facing a huge disruption um, because the, you know, homogeneous uh, enterprise environment that has supported them is sort of, yeah, who cares? You know, if you have a Macintosh or a Windows machine or um, an iPhone, you just want it to work. And by the way, you want all of your stuff to be everywhere. Um, so the entire architecture of everything moving to the cloud, mobility um, uh, is changing the game. They're ready to have stuff. Question is, you know, do they have the market power or willingness um, uh, to survive through this disruption? We'll see, right? Um, it happened to us at AOL. Uh, all of our critical mass and um, our strength was based on bringing something that was really inherently complicated, taking a household and putting it online. Circa early 90s, right. we had to go out, build out, you know, uh, analog pops in, in, in uh, switching centers, backhaul fiber to a data center, practically invent what a, date, a modern data center was, and just make it so, put your phone number in, we'll get you online. No dialers, no browsers, we made you not think about it. And that was the strength we built to 30 million households worldwide. Um, and got you doing email and instant messaging and sorta, we were the drug dealers of that era. But then broadband was coming along and we knew it would be highly disruptive um, because we did not own that infrastructure. And it's not like we were saying, oh, well, that's never happening to us. You know, we knew it was gonna happen. Um, and, uh, uh, but, you know, we had a certain profit structure for a dial-up customer. They were very profitable. And to flip them over to broadband in that era made them margin negative. Very hard to go to the street and say, well, we have a little news for you. Um, you know, we're going to lose money after we're we've doomed. been printing money for the last few years. And we're going to lose oh. money for three or four years. But I'll tell you afterwards, we're going to be like what Google is going to be in the future. Uh -huh. So we just decided to let them do the job. Um, <laughs> yeah. Great strategy. By the way, God, I would have loved that example. meeting, right? Another another example. Example. We're going to cover the questions, so yeah. be, uh -huh. be ready. Yeah. Yeah. Another yeah. example that's really a good lesson is Kodak. 
I mean, yeah. Kodak was undone so, by the technology it invented. They invented. Yeah. yeah, and uh, you know they, they're selling the patents now because uh, they need they need they're they're bankrupt essentially. But they saw it coming. I talked to did a little work with Kodak. Talked to Mary They saw the iceberg. They just couldn't yeah. turn. Well, the ship. well, I, I will say that I, I think they I we worked with them to do you've got pictures um, uh, to let your pictures and do early picture sharing. Um, and uh, they were off by 15 years on when digital yeah. and film were going to pass each other. Mm -hmm. um, and they were just absolutely convinced they didn't have a problem until, you know, uh, 2010, 2015. Um, huh. so. But the, I mean, the, other, the other amazing story is Nokia. Nokia knew, right, yeah. Nokia knew smartphones were coming. Yeah. You know, Nokia had all they, the they, they had a smartphone. They, had a, they, they were pioneers in yes. smartphone operating systems. And, uh, you know, but what happened? I don't know. And just remember, <laughs> one year ago, um, Facebook and social signal and social search was going to completely disrupt Google. <laughs> and um, you guys seem to be doing just fine yeah. for right now. So yeah. timing matters. And mm -hmm. speaking of timing, it's time for some uh, audience questions. So there are some microphones. Please raise your hand, and I will respond to the sound of the microphone, because I might not see who yeah. is asking the question. Oh, it's a go. talking microphone. Please. Oh, no. Hi, Bob Molinari, MedStars. So all of these grand visions are, are wonderful, but it stuns me how these advanced technologies, uh, how often they fail to work. I have yet to go down Page Mill Road and not have my calls drop. Here we go. So, um, you know, how reliable do they need to be when they're driving your car and doing other life critical events? I mean, we aren't, aren't even close to the level of reliability we need in getting a cell phone not to drop the call. So, uh, just one quick question. Uh, would you be willing to pay three times the price of your monthly service to have your calls not drop? If it worked perfectly, yes. You would? You're well, not that, the typical consumer. That puts you in there, right. Yeah. <laughs> you have to be fault yeah. tolerant. Right. <laughs> so you would, I mean, I mean it, it's the, it is the standard question about the yeah. self-driving car, which is, oh my God, you know, my email crashes. How can I trust my car not to crash? Are you right. using Gmail or something? <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Actually, I'm still using AOL. Yeah, now. AOL. Right. <laughs> that I can attest to. That. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. So I. I mean, I, how is I? I. I don't. I don't believe for a moment that we will see pervasive self-driving cars you know, within the next 12, 12, 12 years, we will see them, you know, the same way we see them now, right? Sure. But, I mean, I, are you, I, I, what sort of level, uh, I mean, I think there might be some fleet things here and there, there might be a couple. Do you really think self-driving cars are gonna be, uh, you know, where's it gonna, where's the tipping point? So I, I remember, there are some technologies where you make a smooth transition. Mm -hmm. I don't think you'll have any problem finding self-parking cars. There are already self-parking cars. Right, right. I don't think you'll find have any trouble finding cars that have pretty sophisticated collision avoidance mechanisms right, right, right. and more sophisticated cruise control. Mm -hmm. And then in some uh, certain kinds of environments, I think you could have fully autonomous cars. Like I said, yeah, separate yeah. lane down. Yeah, yeah. down yeah. I don't think. Yeah, yeah. I think the technology no, well, is trivial. So it's not. Yeah. It's not yeah. going to just pop into existence all of a sudden. But you'll right. see a transition in some areas, and you'll see some yeah. uh, controlled environments in other areas where I think you're really yeah, they'll work just fine. Yeah, I, I guess yeah. The, it's back to the issue of how fast is this going to happen. And, you know, again, it's exciting to see, quote unquote, how fast Tesla has happened. But on the other hand, you know, Tesla started in 2002. Is that something like that? Eight years ago. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, well, whatever. Yeah. I, I, yeah. But, yeah, oh. whenever it started. Um, but it's, you know, it, it's, and God bless, you know, we'll have some, Number, several thousands of cars in, in America, but it's hardly, I mean, we happen to see all of them here in yeah, Santa Clara, much. Valley, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which is really, really We're cool. Bubble. But, you know, the, the, you know, the pace of change, I think, is going to be, uh, you know, ain't going to be overnight. Yeah, some of this, look, uh, to answer your question, we could have much better cell service. Um, consumers have come to accept a certain level of service at a certain price as being acceptable. But, you know, hopefully um, you're talking hands-free and when your call drops you're not having road rage and you kill somebody. What we worry about is that 
in, in, in the case of an autonomous car that people don't get hurt. But to that point, um, you know, being an investor in Tesla and being interested in autonomous vehicles, uh, I spent some time researching um, the transition from ho horseless carriage to car. I was curious as to like, you know, how resistant were people to that idea? And it's fascinating because um, the big worry about the horseless vehicle was that you were eliminating one of the brains. <laughs> Uh, one of the brains being the horse, because you know horses typically are not going to drive into a bunch of people or drive you off of a cliff, whereas a drunk person just might, mm -hmm. or a machine that a human couldn't particularly control well might crash and hurt a bunch of people. Um, I would say that the weak link in transportation today are the humans, not the machines. So and that, you know, an autonomous car would probably be far, far safer than um, ones driven by humans. But I, would s I will also say that the market psychology, the acceptance right. Right. of, you know, robotic cars driving around and how you would get them to commingle with human-driven ones, that's probably the much more formidable problem than making oh, right. the robot car right. yeah, reliable. I mean, yeah, and we haven't even touched on yeah. lawyers and insurance companies, right? Yeah, yeah. right? Now there's <laughs> where we need some robots we can turn there on. Are, there, are <laughs> over, there are over a million uh, traffic fatalities per year, the vast yeah. majority caused by driver error. Right. What other questions I do we have? I think I have the microphone. Uh, Ward Hansen at Stanford. Uh, there was an interesting story in the New York Times about China announcing that in the next, uh, by next 12 years or something, they wanted to move 250 million people out of the countryside into the cities. There hasn't really been a discussion about China yet in, in particular, mm -hmm. uh, but something like that, uh, the sort of huge transformation demographic, uh, any thoughts on, on those sorts of changes? Yeah, well, so I, Spent a fair amount of time in China and invested there and have been mucking around in China since the late 90s. And it's fascinating. Um, there's certain things you can do um, when you have their kind of government system um, that we can't do. Um, and, and, you know, so if you look at China, they do now have a country that about the size of the U.S., maybe bigger, that is emerging middle class coastal cities, feels like being here. And then you got another billion who are living in per capita, 3,000 a year or something like that. Stone Age type conditions that, um, you know, they, they know enough of what's going on that it's potential cultural disaster. So they want to migrate these people um, into what we would call the 21st century, but they want to do it in an orderly fashion. How do they do that? Well, they put up spec cities. Um, they build cities, they build manufacturing around it, they build schools, they carefully meter how many people they move in, educate how many kids will get college education degrees. I'm invested in actually in a for-profit university in China, very carefully regulated how many kids are allowed to go because they don't want to have unemployment. They want jobs for them. They want they want it to be very carefully orchestrated. Um, and what that presumes is, because they license every business um, to be in business, if you're going to be an aircraft company in China, they're going to tell you where your plant's going to be. And it's going to be in one of those cities that they just built. And they're going to have the schools and the systems done in a way that the um, kids are educated to be in the plant, and the housing and all the other stuff is going to fall into place. Um, you know, uh, go to Mississippi where uh, education's horrible. The son who was in Teach for America, I've been there up close and personal. Um, we need to do that there. We need to build stuff and build schools um, for the industry that we put there. And we should be doing that same thing inside of our country. Now, we can't because that's not how we operate. We can only try and do it with incentives. Um, uh, and, you know, I wouldn't say that the Chinese methodology is necessarily so bad um, and might solve some problems for us. But <laughs> well, I, well no, I was just going to say, at MGI, we've studied a lot about urbanization, right? And it's, <coughs> it's, it's, it's a powerful economic force. When people move to cities, they actually become more productive. 
living standards tend to increase. But that's really going to happen when the infrastructure goes in with it, right? And so there's a lot of interesting things around these disruptive technologies that are about smart cities. But the other interesting thing is in, in terms of on top of that technology, you actually need governance to make it happen. So the existence of things like mayors actually makes a big difference. And not every country actually has that type of governance. Um, but we do think this urbanization uh, trend is huge and has tremendous potential, positive <coughs> as well as negative, unless it's done right. So, so I think one, uh, to throw a macroeconomic perspective here, uh, China has a bit of the problem we were talking about before with AOL and with Kodak, where they've built their economy on doing a couple things, namely manufacturing, exports, and investment. I guess that's three things. And uh, it's unbalanced. They've got to shift towards a more domestic consumption-driven economy. But they're so good at this other stuff. How do they manage to make that shift? They know it. They know that's what they have to do. Uh, every external observer knows this. It's just hard for them to make that transition because they've invested so much in the uh, acquiring the skills that they're doing now. What else do we have? So, yeah, I'm Rakesh Agrawal from Microsoft Research. Uh, so I think I saw this interesting list of disruptive technologies. I was wondering if the panel has thought about what could be the biggest impediment for these technologies to be becoming deployed in a massive way. For example, you know, you guys were talking about bonding of phone with people. That essentially means that something like cloud has to know much more about people, and that can cause huge amount of spookiness. And unless the technology is developed in some way where the spookiness is avoided, that could become a showstopper. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering for each of these technologies, have you guys thought about what could be the showstoppers? Well, I completely agree with you that regulation is a potential problem. I think the important thing to keep in mind is first do no harm, that uh, there are lots of places that regulation could make deployment of these technologies uh, <coughs> problematic. And in my view, you should really, uh, as I think we have been to, uh, to, in the U.S. to a fairly large degree of trying to be accommodating to these technologies. And when something goes wrong and you try to fix it uh, in Europe, I think they're much more resistant to change because uh, the disruption is really uncomfortable uncom <coughs> to the existing uh, incumbents. So the whole point about disruption is somebody gets disrupted the ones who get disrupted don't like it, and they're going to fight back through various uh, means, whether that's uh, economic, <coughs> political, regulatory, whatever. Bill, yeah. any other thoughts? Yeah, I think. I mean, it, it, the, I think case by case, depending on which technology we're talking about, <coughs> there are a set of challenges that you know I think Hal's referred to. I mean. Some are, are sort of cultural popular, and you know, clearly uh, things like nuclear can get, you, know, you get this, this dramatic swing in the acceptability of certain things to, based on you know, the event. And or you know, the, other, you know, the other big issue is this whole privacy security issue. Um, we were blithely sharing our stuff all over the place, handing out our social security numbers and credit cards, you know, <coughs> to random, you know, 18-year-olds in cafes or whatever. I mean, it's until suddenly, you know, these various, this, these various what are essentially corner events for us as individuals um, pop up and cause, whoomph, you know, this transformation in the framework in which we look at these technologies. And so, you know, that's... That's what makes it a horse race, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, cloud computing is a great example. You go up south of market, every one of those startups is running on cloud mm -hmm. computing, without, without an exception that I've, ever, uh, that I've seen, no. uh, because it just lowers the entry cost dramatically to be able to rent rather than have to buy. So you don't <laughs> see that same uh, kind of, uh, of innovation going on in Europe, in part, I, th I believe because of these regulatory issues. If you put in, uh, right. if you put on regulation about data transfer across borders, you put in regulation that's uh, non-constructive privacy regulation, you can really impede that kind of innovation. Mm -hmm. And that's something where the technologies are there, the brains are there, the people are there, but it's just the uh, regulatory structure is 
somewhere else. That's fair. I mean, it's, it is as much grief as we give our government and as much grief as we give California for being primitive in terms, I mean, it's unbelievable how stupid California is in so many ways. Oh, yeah. It's still so much better <laughs> than, you know, you go other places on the planet and you hear kind of what the rules are and you go, you, you're kidding. That's not really, right? That, that's not really the rule when it comes to, you know, employment and bankruptcy and stock options <coughs> and, you know, and regulation and compliance. It's, it's unbelievable how, how nice it is here for as, for as much pain as we, we still experience. I mean, <laughs> what else? Any Keith other questions Lance. before we go to the lightning round? Go ahead. Keith Lance, <laughs> Lance Consulting. I was sort of surprised that there wasn't much mention of health care. Mm -hmm. In fact, only one in the, in the McKinsey tome, only one of the 12 chapters is devoted to health care. And I know at least one of the panelists avoids life sciences, but I'm curious, at least two people in the room, Dr. Formanari here didn't bring this up, at least believe there's a major disruption coming by enabling individuals, patients, as opposed to hospitals. So kind of curious what uh, your perspectives are. In all fairness, multiple well, we, we chapters. Well, we thought Obama fixed health care, so we don't look yeah. at it anymore. <laughs> Well, uh, so, okay. I, so I, earlier I was singing the praises of uh, the NSF and uh, ARPA, and one of the things they've been investing in is remote surgery and robotic surgery, which could be huge game changers from a cost-effectiveness point of view. Uh, you know, you already have surgeries that are highly robotic-assisted, and uh, it's a little bit like the car example. Mm -hmm. I think you can move more and more step-by-step -step little pieces of that technology over to... Uh, automation and maybe eventually you'll end up uh, with, a, with a fully automated system. That's probably more than a decade away, but, but you can see progress being made in that area. Uh, I, think it, I, I think it's a huge win because when you look at our own budget issues, health care is the problem. If you can cut the rate at which health care costs are growing, you can have a huge impact on the economy, bigger than driverless cars. Right, right. I, I, mm. I've got a, uh, you know, a, a bias on this topic, which is basically that, I, you know, I think healthcare is overwhelmingly not a technology issue. It's overwhelmingly a human issue and a policy issue, and obviously policy is related to humans. But, you know, the thesis, there is a thesis that sounds like it's a great thesis, that if we had more knowledge about what we should be doing correctly and about, you know, monitoring ourselves, that we could be healthier. But we have, all, we have pretty much all the knowledge we need not to be fat or not to smoke or not to do other bad things, and we still do them. So, I, I, you know, T, God bless all the monitoring technologies that we're enabling, and I think, I think, they, I, I think there's some good investments there, to be honest. I think there's going to be plenty of opportunity to invest in enabling technologies around monitoring, whether it's at the consumer level or at the, you know, institutional level. I think there's lots of technologies that will succeed there, but I don't think they make a, a dent in the problem we've got at the healthcare level in the grant, you know, in the in the macro sense. But that's just me. <laughs> uh, I'm, you know, look, I think um, that from a pure science and technology point of view, um, we are probably on the cusp of um, a revolution in in medicine. I'm not saying healthcare. In medical science, that's akin from going from bloodletting and leeches to um, antibiotics, and that relates to genomics. Um, but this now, you know, just look at the formidable regulatory issues there are in creating new drugs and therapies and diagnostics. Now overlay the GMO controversy because you could be a GMO. Um, and if uh, you want to cure cancer, you might have to GMO you. Um, and uh, uh, so, uh, I mean, I think there's extraordinary promise in an area that's one of the most fascinating and disruptive um, places, and that's our ability to read and write DNA. Um, and, uh, however, as an investable theme, mm -hmm. and, and, and all the things we've talking, have talked about, how then these changes then get into society, um, either for regulatory issues or willingness to do it, all of those things come into play. 
Um, and I think it's going to be a very fascinating 10 years on that front. Yeah, I would just add, uh, you know, if you, if you look underneath the sizings of a lot of those trillions of dollars we found there, <coughs> across a lot of the technology, whether it's not advanced robotics in terms of prosthesis, next generation genomics, not killing people, you know, in, in vehicular accidents, et cetera, a tremendous amount of them can actually be attributable to health. Let's call it health instead of health care necessarily. Mm -hmm. It's funny that we call people patients when there actually are people out there. Uh, so <laughs> we think there's a tremendous <laughs> amount of potential there that, that really is related to health. Hmm. Who, has the, who has the mic? Right. Let's go here. Oh, here. Shout it out. Oh. No, Hang on. No. Can't do it. Whoever has the mic has no, the power. Uh, okay. All right. All right. You That's won't make it onto YouTube uh, servers. Right. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is Ramji. I had a question around the disruption it begins, uh, you know, that happens to the venture industry as a result of all these disruptive technologies. Unlike putting a couple of million into the hot internet startup, these fundamental technologies require hundreds of millions of dollars of investment, right? That changes your investing style, your risk profile, and the potential to absorb losses. How do you think about a different model of investing in this? disruptive technologies? Well, I guess I, I question the premise that, you know, because these are big themes, um, that investing requires hundreds of millions of dollars to participate in the themes. So, I mean, I, I you know, the venture industry can't by itself transform the energy economy, but, you know, we can invest in innovative technologies that <coughs> investing across a large number of them are going to make a, an aggregate dent. And so you've got thousands of VCs, you know, investing in thousands of companies that are all being innovative across these different themes, and you have an aggregate impact that can be massive. So I, that doesn't worry me so much in terms of, uh, you know, do you have to invest big dollars to have, to have you know, the, the world progress. I don't, I don't think well, you do. I agree with Hal that I think it's a collaborative thing. We're not alone. We've got, you know, we've got large corporations who are investing way, way, way more than the venture industry invests, you know, in innovative technologies. Plus, you know, government <coughs> research universities. I mean, there's, there's a lot of investment going on in innovation and progress. Well, I, I think it is fair to say that there are some big infrastructure investments that create the environment for a lot of what I call combinatorial innovation, where you have all of these uh, new innovations take advantage of those infrastructures. So a fab plant is a billion dollar investment, mm -hmm. data center is a billion dollar investment. There are these cases where you have to have uh, the, uh, the financial system and the uh, in, in investment uh, right. process right. in place to create those infrastructures. But, the, but I think what we're talking about here or all the inf all the innovations that flow from uh, those investments and uh, the ability to take these component parts, whether they're the parts mm -hmm. of the data center, or the uh, or the chips or the software uh, tools, and combine them to make new innovations, is a very very exciting uh, world. It's like what we saw with. Uh, with mechanical parts in the, in the 19th century, with the electrical parts in the 20th right. century, with uh, chips, software, on and on and on. Huge variety of opportunities to innovate based on those fundamental general purpose right. technologies that have been developed. <coughs> that's, your, two that's your Kurzweil chart. <laughs> you know, that shows the lo logarithmic advancement of innovation, not necessarily no. the absorption of it across many different technologies. Yeah. Let's take two more questions and then we'll go to the lightning round. Anything else? I think we have one here. It seems to me that one of the giant Achilles heels that we have now is that software productivity isn't going up. Moore's Law is doing well. The physics society, physical side of thing, the physical infrastructure is doing, but software productivity has not improved in 10 years. Arguably, it hasn't improved much in 20 years. And as long as we have that ball and chain around us, I mean, even the, 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 the self-driving car has become a huge software problem. The little Google correlation engine that it uses to drive now, okay, just doesn't, is does not gonna get you to, to the uncertain world in which you have to drive down the street, for example. So unless we do something about software, we're kind of gonna be able to plateau here. 
Well, well, well. I, I mean, I think you're. I, I would say for the entire history of computers, the hardware guys have always gone way faster than the software, the guys. software guys, <laughs> and uh, mm -hmm. actually have afforded the awesome. software guys to be pretty sloppy. Um, you know, uh, writing assembler back in the 8080 days is pretty hard. Um, <laughs> you know, and uh, high-level languages make 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 it go faster. But look, there's an element of creativity. Um, that comes into play and humanness um, and, uh, and, and whereas Moore's Law is more physics, although they're starting to run into some physical barriers there. Um, they already have. They yeah. already have, exactly. So, uh, um, you know, I think, you, I think, yes, you're right. I mean, and uh, is, is there a solution? Maybe when machines can write code. There's a solution. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, <coughs> it's not as though you know, it's not as though we're in a cul-de-sac. I mean, it, yeah. yes, it, it absolutely. I you know, I think we agree that that software has not lived up to its promise, but fortunately, um, it has made progress, and we continue to make progress. And you know, yeah. we should have multi-threading. You know, it, 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 that should be much better than it is, but it ain't. You know, but we're making progress. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know about that. I, I, <laughs> well, I, 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 I have to agree it's the binding constraint, but I would dispute the fact that we haven't made any progress. You know, what, uh, what, the, the, the phrase I like, uh, this little <coughs> poem I recite to myself on occasion, I hate this damn computer. I think I'm going to sell it. It won't do what I want it to, but only what I tell it. Let's take that one more question okay. here. That's, that's the software <laughs> writer's <laughs> dilemma right there. It only does what you tell it to do. I think there's an awful <laughs> lot of shared code out there and object-oriented you know, approaches to coding were a game changer. You can write some nice things pretty fast. Well, there's, I mean, there are plenty of software people yeah. in the audience here. I mean, I, God bless if you can solve the problem. Keep, you know, go ahead. <laughs> Hi, uh, Tim Berlin, medical doctor from South Africa. Um, we know that all trends, no trend exists in isolation. <laughs> and we've looked at technological trends tonight, what would you say are the non-technological trends which would be viewed as synergistic to the techno technological trends that we've been looking at? Let's have one trend each. Bill. Well, I'll go back to the one that I talked about, which is the interconnection of humans on the planet is, you know, is a tightly interrelated but not pure technological trend that, that enables supports and, you know, a, 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 a lot of the future. Barry. Uh, I, I agree. I, I think that in, in the history of humanity, we make leaps when we share information. And so printing press helped you share information um, versus telling verbally and got it more dispersed. Electronic media did, then the internet came along, and now you truly have a collective brain. Now the question is, you have the infrastructure for the sharing. The question is, do you have the humanity to want to put it to work? How? Spread of English. <laughs> Same thing. Come back to communication. Yeah, yeah, What's, yeah. What drives it in part is going to be a spread of a common language. Translators can help a lot, but I think it's, uh, you know, business operates on English, and I think education worldwide will be operating on Great. English. All right. Michael, Michael, what's yours? What? What's your trend? Oh, yes. Hey, 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 hey McKenzie. Yeah. Spot. Hey. You're, you're the smart guy Come out on, here. McKenzie. <laughs> here, you want to borrow my watch? I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm wearing two. <laughs> <laughs> Governance. Governance. All right. Okay. Governance. Rapid that's, fire. That's, All right. That's, that's Just a couple minutes. Oh, here we go. Oh, oh, Ready? We're going to start right. with Bill. Yeah. What's the most underhyped technology? Under Additive manufacturing. Very. Underhyped or over? Under. Underhyped. Underhyped, um, uh, I, I, I would say genomics. Hell, fracking. What is the most overhyped technology? Hell. Oh, that's a tough one. There's somebody to choose from. <laughs> Pick one. All right. Big data. Fair. Um, blended learning. I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, Wikipedia. The singularity. <laughs> what incumbent company is most threatened by disruptive technologies, Bill? What incumbent is most threatened by what? disruptive technologies? Boy, mm, um, are tough. the Chinese government. <laughs> 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 That's good. Microsoft. 
Europe. <laughs> company or country? It was company, company but whatever. Uh, well, well the only, the, uh, there's only Chinese one country. The only one country qualifies. That's yeah. Singapore. They're doing fine. Mm -hmm. okay. China, China qualifies. As yeah. What big company has the most to gain from disruptive technologies? Hell, Google. <laughs> I agree. I'm going to say IBM. Which what? country will lead in the development of disruptive technologies, Bill? U.S. Yeah, absolutely. Agreed. Oh. What country will be the most important customer for disruptive technologies, Hal? Uh, China. China. U.S. Fascinating. <clears throat> Present company excluded, who would you most like to pay attention to about disruptive technologies? Ooh. Bill. Ah, shoot, I was going to say Halvarian. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> who would I most like to? Boy, Steve Jurvetson. Oh, that, yeah, yeah, definitely <laughs> Steve, for sure. I'm stuck. <laughs> Larry Page. Oh, you answer for right. That's great. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank I'll you very that. much. Appreciate your yeah. attention. <laughs> Thank you. That was, that was cruel. <laughs> Thank you all so much for sharing your perspectives so freely. This has been a marvelous discussion, and that is because of how you presented yourselves to us tonight. As if I felt as if we were they were having dinner together.